You're listening to the Tuesday Review. I'm Nathan. As always, joined by Alan. Hey, going, Alan? Good, thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, and joined by Callum. Hey, going, Callum? Yeah, I'm not bad. All right, we're running a little bit behind tonight, so we're going to get straight into it. We're going to start with a bit of an introduction. So this week is the first week of our MIF coverage, essentially. Yes. For those uh, uninitiated, that's the Melbourne International Film Festival. Yes, and because this show for listeners, um, you know, who listen to the podcast, we technically we go over the radio first. So that gives us some special privileges as media. So we get to see some movies before they're released through their screeners list. Yes, we're always thankful. Um, we don't expect it, but no. we do appreciate it. We and do apply, and we, but we don't expect anything. Yeah, and we're, we're happy to obviously take on that responsibility and bring out content for the people. So, but first, we mentioned last week that we're going to go see a movie premiere. Yes. Um, called Resonance uh, at the Capitol Theatre on Saturday. Come down and say hello if you listen to the show. Uh, I had the pleasure of talking to the director, Matt Mirams last week, um, just for a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, it was funny because the first thing he said was he listened to a Ghostbusters episode and he loved Ghostbusters. And, um, you know, we chatted a little bit about the Australian film industry and how it's a bit of a struggle, right? Yeah. We go out of our way to try and support local filmmakers and creatives, in ter- in- including video games and everything else, right? We, Melbourne should be doing more. Yeah. Like, the the big guys have enough money going around and stuff. Yes, there's the actual works for the big guys don't, but the actual big guys have plenty, whereas the independents, they need a little support. Yeah, and, you know, there is Australian local, lots of local Australian content coming, but it's always usually through stre- streaming, right? Yeah. And to my knowledge, Vic Screen really partners with someone. They don't really pony up the cash themselves. Like, for instance, a lot of the Vic Screen either goes to video games with a proven track record or a much lower budget. Not to like a feature film. Yeah. Or if they're going to a feature film, then they partner with Stan or Binge or someone else that kind of can facilitate it a bit further. Yeah. So there's a big Australian streaming industry, but not really a big Australian film industry. And that's something that he talked about a little bit. That's the secret of the Australian film industry is there isn't one. Yeah. And I guess, you know, it's something that we try to bring attention to. And um, he said he listened to our Ghostbusters episode. And I had a giggle because he also suggested we watch a grand, the, the Grand Scheme, one of his shorts. Oh, yeah. Which I enjoyed. And there's a Ghostbusters quote in there, which I had to giggle at. I'm like, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, obviously how we re- we, uh, we reeled him in. They ain't afraid of no ghost. Yeah. yeah. I ain't afraid of no ghost. Um, so I thought, look, we, we'd probably talk about that little short first, but we're also going to go see another, uh, technically not supporting Melbourne creatives, supporting South Australian creatives. We're still Australian. As long as they're not from New South Wales, it's fair game, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, we joke, we joke, we joke. We'll support New South Wales creators. You're just not from Sydney. That's, yeah. that's it. <laughs> um, for all, it's Emotion is Dead, which is uh, a film that I thought Alan would be interested in, being a car guy. Yes. It's like a drama about the, I guess, the downfall of the Australian kind of car industry through a lens of South Australia and Holden or whatever yes. it might so be. So there's a, there was a large um, Holden plant in uh, in South Australia where they built a lot of the Holden cars that that, have, that were sold here and, and globally, technically speaking. Whereas here in, uh, I think if it was a Melbourne-centric story, it would be the Ford plants. Yeah. The one in Broadman and the one in Geelong. Um, but, you know, obviously, in this context, it's, it's Holden. Yeah. yeah. So we've got a couple of exciting, uh, you know, oh. local indie movies coming this week. Uh, mm-hmm. But I thought we'd start with talking about the grand scheme, because I think if you can watch it, it's actually a pretty good short movie. Uh, yeah. Is it available anywhere? Uh, we got sent a Vimeo link. I don't know if we're allowed to share it, but um, I'm sure you can Google it. We'll, we'll, I'll find Might out while we're talking YouTube about it. Something. Yeah, it's probably on YouTube or something. But um, so yes, Matt Miram's uh, made this as well as the feature we're going to go see on Saturday, and I like I quite like this short. It's like just it's like a vignette of kind of little stories about making movies or about directing. Yeah. So it's like what there's a few feature films and one kind of theater play that's being directed. And it, it's pretty entertaining. I did like the the filmmaking is actually excellent in this that short film. Yeah, like there's lots of long takes and kind of there's no shaky cam and yeah, that's what I noticed. It's um, very cinematic. It's yeah. very professionally done. Yeah, and it's the way the way one short kind of I guess becomes the meta, editing. Yeah, it, it flows into the next short. Yeah. Where it's you're like they'll like, shut a door and then the next short starts yeah. with the door opening and like it's very or, or a seamless. person from I guess where the first short is like a scene. A person from that scene goes and lives their life, but that turns out to be another scene, and you're like, ah, you got me. Yeah. Uh, I was, <laughs> yeah the whole no. time I was like, is this another scene? Yeah. Is this another scene? No, and it's only 16 minutes, yeah. but it kind of weaves, what is it, like four or five kind of little short little, narratives. Yeah, stories. 
Uh, and I thought it was quite effective, and I suggest everyone goes. We'll we'll share a link to it uh, if we can. I've got to find out if it's available anywhere first. But, um, I think I think I have to agree with Cal that my favorite person was the girl, uh, the director that was a little girl. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, how she was being asked about what she knows about pregnancy, and she's like, oh, I was a baby not too long ago." Not that long ago. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> I just like the fact that you was because it's like they're speaking French and it's interesting, and then it's just like this Aussie little girl. I was like, "That's funny." Like she has any business I, being a director? I did like the old lady that was speaking poor, like French really poorly. She was like, as she was very clearly reading the lines, the one that was ordering. Yeah, yeah, uh, that was uh, a good short film. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll uh, you know we'll facilitate that on our socials if we can, if it's available anyway. I'm not yeah. sure. Um, um, I found that the shorts got stronger the the um, the, the more it went on. Yeah. Like my, I think that like my 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 favorite order was inverse, if that makes sense. Like I liked the last one the most. Yeah. And then you know, um, so it has a not a rocky start, but for me, I just that that first shot didn't hit those beats for me because I think it's one of those things where you have to have a certain type of sense of humor or you have to be seeing it in a mm. certain way for it to resonate with you. Whereas like all the shorts offer something, but for me, I found most value in the the last two shorts. Um, I thought they were all good. They all offer something yeah. different. Yeah, I'm not detracting from the first short. I like just that, that first short for me is that giant. It's one big giant long take, which I really appreciate. Yeah, I, uh, I, it makes me excited for the film because obviously, like the man, the, the man, man knows, knows how to direct. The, and, yeah. Like this is not. This sounds like small praise, but it's really not. He knows how to hold a camera, which is a huge <laughs> green flag because it's almost the lost art form in Hollywood is yeah. holding a camera still. <laughs> yeah, it's true. So, you know, I'm kind of excited. You look at all the Marvel movies and just like, shake, 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 shake. Especially since, shake, you know, shake, presumably there's going to be a lot of tension running through this film on Saturday night. Yeah. That's so one I'm, of the I'm other excited. things. That's one of the other things we talked about when talking about cinemas and movies today. Um, like, when you're trying to get people in seats, and this is one thing he said, he had to make this movie fun. And the movie had like 40 different drafts. Yeah. He worked on this and it's writing's rewriting. Yeah. And he, like, he worked on this for years and years trying to get the right feel. Mm. And, but the movie, above all else, is fun. It'll Ooh, have you yeah. giggling the whole time and it'll have you kind of having some feels. Um, and that's one thing, like he said, he's going to have to live with this movie forever. Yeah, once it's so done, it has it's to done. be something, yep. like it, it, once it's out in the world, people are going to associate that with him. So it has yeah. to be something that he is proud Unless of. it's a Netflix production, there's no backsies. <laughs> no, but also the stakes are a lot lower if you make a movie for Netflix, you get paid up front, I would assume, right? Yeah. Depending on the contract. Yeah, depending on the contract, I'd say. But uh, it's, you know, if Netflix is paying for it, oh, it's their time. You yeah. know what I mean? But yeah, like, true. if you're making I mean, a movie with your money, you want yeah. to make sure it's extra, be sure it's something you're proud of. Yeah, like, there's there's a safety net of like, yes, you're not financially out of it, but yeah, especially, I guess, for more grassroots film producers, it's a personal point of pride mm. that you don't want yeah. to sacrifice it. You don't want to be, again, like... It, hopefully the vision is that they had is portrayed on the screen and people kind of appreciate it. Otherwise, it does hurt when you're like, damn it, I put all this effort in and people don't like it. Uh, it uh, must be hard. And this is a question I have to remember to ask him uh, if we're lucky enough to get an interview locked in. Is like, I always wonder when you hear about people do so many drafts, and I'm sure it's the same with the grand scheme. How accurate is the final product to what you hoped it would be? Because it's such, it's such a difficult thing to get something from the imagination onto the screen or onto the page or the TV or what have you. And, like, that's a question we should ask everyone. It's like, you know, what did you have to compromise anything? Well, that's something we asked all the video game developers at PAX, too. Like, yeah. what's a feature that you wanted to include that you had to leave out? Yeah, and like, what's, a, what's the same the big, can be said for films. What's the big compromise? Because I'm interested in that. I want to know, what did they have to leave on the cutting room floor? Or what idea could he just not translate at that moment in time? Because, not you know, if you try writing something or making something... You know, your skills aren't going to be where you want them to be to make this big idea you have because you won't know how to articulate it. Yeah. yeah. And like, that's what I want. I have to... You boys, don't let me forget because I want to uh, ask that question. We're, we're, you know? It's not always just like, oh, yes, we wanted a, you know, 42-foot tall giant thing robot to beat somebody up. Like, that. those are, you know, financial constraints. But other things like you've chosen uh, your main, you know, lead and they whatever you're trying to make them do, they just won't do it the right way not the right way yeah. but the way you want them to you can't get the dialogue yeah. the, the yeah. how you it, want to express it, it it may be a case that just it's that person that actor like yeah. it may be different well, you can't actor. get the vibe right yeah. could even be the location the location. location's yeah. just not right yeah so it's interesting and like we've talked to a few and it, it feels like these days maybe it's just because we're engaging more with the universe with the show than we did back in the day but there's we feel like there's more independent filmmakers at least trying to chase their dreams yeah 
Because like we've talked to a few, we talked to Aaron McJames with his low budget feature Astro Loco, which is on mm. is it Amazon Prime? Yeah, it's on Prime. It's awesome. So we, we also recommend people go watch that. One Punch with Darcy Yule is a yeah. fantastic, fantastic movie. Film film, lo- film locally to us here. In uh, it was filmed in Coburg mostly. Yeah. Uh, and that was shot on an iPhone. That's on Tubi. Yeah. yeah, it blows my mind the things you can do these days. Mm. Yeah, um, and we obviously we talk, We also talked to Bird Eater uh, director Jack Clark about his movie. That had more funding, but that was a struggle. Like when we talked to him, he said they had to go through multiple rounds of funding with different bodies and different governments oh, funding. It's him. funny uh, when Australian cinema went nas- went international with Late Night with the Devil. The amount of people made jo- like so many people made jokes about just all the production companies that flash on the screen when the movie started because you don't really get that in Hollywood. In Hollywood, no. if there's a good script, people will just kind of fund it. There'll be yeah. like a few different. But like with Australian movies, because you know you, they tend to, and from my obvious my expert understanding, um, they tend to you know finance little pieces at a time. So you have to get like six production companies to each give you a little bit of money yeah. to get it made. And they talk about that. Uh, Jack Clark talks about that yeah. when we interviewed him for Bird Eater, and that's a problem. It's no funny though, when international fight, audiences yeah. are subjected to yeah, everyone, everyone's to like that. hedging their bets. They're so like, "I'm not going to give you all the money. Yeah, yeah. you find the rest, but I'll give you a bit." No one, no one. In- Really wants to finance Australian cinema, and mm. it's a problem with cinema itself. Yeah, obviously Australia is a much smaller market. Yeah, but cinemas can't afford to take a risk as well, right? And show these smaller Australian indie yeah. films when they've got a sure bet with Marvel and the yeah. Disney films like, that they know like, kids are going to see. When you got a finite amount of screens, and, yeah, you know, and like you know, Disney's taking fifty yeah, percent, and then yeah. Glenn Powell's taking up thirty percent, and then whatever. <laughs> You know, like, it must yeah. be hard. Imagine being an Aussie director going up against Twisters with Glenn Powell or yeah. Long Legs with Nicolas Cage. Yeah. Where you can't, like, this, our cinema industry isn't designed to support indie films. Even if, like, for example, you know, we live in the northwestern suburbs. If we wanted to go to an indie cinema, we basically have to go to at least Brunswick. Yeah. But even then, it's like most of, we might get one indie film session and then you kind of have to just go to the Astor or, like, one of the other, the the hipster places there's we don't really do local indie yeah and it's weird to have that i don't know i hate not hipsters but like depending on where you're from particularly where we're from hipsters don't have the best reputation you know uh it is what it is but like having like these cinemas have like the reputation of oh that's the hipster cinema yeah it kind of also you're you're gatekeeping you're gatekeeping and i guess some people may be like i don't want to go there like i'll just go to my hoyts which damn you hoyts yeah (laughs) like I don't know, I'm just saying, if we want good Indian movies, we know where yeah, to go. They, yeah, they, they do the Indian movies, but... Even, like, the even the mid-tier hipster cinemas, they do, like, the A24 movies that, like, other cinemas won't play. Like, if I wanted to go see Bird Eater, it's... I'm not sure what how wide the release uh, was. It's, like, the Nova. Yeah, it's probably, like, one or two sessions at the Nova. Cinemas. And then, like, that's kind of it, you know? I remember... Like, we've probably talked about this on the show once before, but years ago, we were lucky enough to see Mother at Broadmeadows Hoyts. I'm sorry, I just doxed our one of our cinemas. That's right. Anyway, that's that was right. bu- that was oh, bizarre. Right. R- refer yeah. to our uh, stalker episode. Uh, what was it? Uh, Baby reindeer episode. If you want to, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. We didn't say people where we live. They just, they just know the cinema we go to. Yeah. One of them, yeah. Um, we go to many cinemas. Uh, speaking of Brody, um, Residence uh, was partly filmed in Broadmeadows. Yeah, they used the uh, ta- the town hall where our radio station's antenna is located. Yeah, to or shoot. Was located. Or was located. Okay. Fun yeah. fact about that as well. They also you filmed um, the Gotham TV show Police Station in Broadmeadows Town Hall. Yeah, yeah. so it's a popular location because it's filming as police station. I guess it looks like a police station. Uh, right? Well, I, the interior is really open, so I think it's easy to convert it to whatever. Uh, you they need can to just be. set dress it how they yeah. want it. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense. Um, anyway, <laughs> I'm moving was... along to our feature review. Uh, anyone else have anything to say before we move on? Uh, say. Happy to move on. Um, I've got plenty to say about what's coming up, though. Yes. So our first MIF movie for this year, MIF uh, Melbourne International Film Festival 2024, is... Um, Look Into My Eyes. Look Into My Eyes. By Lana Wilson? Something like that. I'm going to get the films up now. Uh, apologies. <laughs> um, so, just for context, Callum correct, tells me... Lana Wilson, yes. Hey, this is a documentary about psychics. So... If someone listens to that, what's your preconceived, you know, notion? Mine was, oh, shit, we're going to be exposing some psychics, right? (laughs) Because (laughs) you hear documentary and you hear psychic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You immediately go to, all right, this is one of those exposés, like, you know, some old people have lost, like, millions of dollars trying to... Al goes into James Randi mode. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I'm ready for this. 
yeah, and yeah, yeah. I was not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, a bit, for me, it was a bit of an emotional roller coaster. Yeah, it, it had some. Emo- it was an emotional movie. Like yeah. I, I think some there were some goofs. There were some goofs. I think ultimately the movie deals with. I would say the movie's subtext is trauma. Yep. Yeah, loss. Uh, trauma and loss, right? And it's all these kinds of things that bring people to see psychics, right? You don't go to a psychic if... Because everything's going well. If everything's going all right. Yeah. Um, or I'll, if, I'll, again, for a goof. But, for a goof. But that's, a diff- that's not the... Yeah. I guess that's not the focal lens no, of this, no. <laughs> this film. You know what I mean? It's not, yeah. hey, look, there's a psychic in the mall. Let's go say hi yeah. and see what's up. But yeah. uh, these are people that go to see psychics because they, I guess, they're not happy with their lives or they want direction or they want a, they want a way to cope with the loss. Yeah. And it also kind of deals with the psychics themselves and like their trauma and their loss and how they can kind of cope with it too. Yeah. I, I'd like to say, again, just before we start into the re- review, um, I think a lot of the whole psychic industry, most of it is a scam, especially the phone psychics, among other things. But the whole idea of if anyone's trying to get you to come back regularly and siphon a lot of, you know, pay money every single time for some kind of closure or some kind of weird prediction, you're getting scammed. You, you should yeah. you know, try and get some help from somebody else that you trust. Um, it, it's, you know, you're not going to find what you're looking for there. But in the context of this movie, sometimes the help you're looking for can't be found in the traditional re- areas. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Like, the, the psychic industry, at least in, like, for, I guess, through the, the focal lens of this film, yeah. it examines people who either have, like, gone through therapy and they do therapy and they have the things, but they can't find necessarily what they want, right? Yeah. And then, in a way, they find it through the psychics. Yeah. It's a form of therapy. Yeah. You know, they, they find ways to deal with their grief and their emotions and... You know, they, they get what they need from their psychic. Mm-hmm. Not I'm um, telling people to go see an unlicensed therapist. No. Um, we, because we that's, don't condone that. We don't condone that. But essentially, that's what these psychics tend yeah. to be. Um, you know, they have little psychic school degrees. Or however much they're actually worth, I, I don't, don't know. know. But <laughs> but, but they, some of them also had, um, one of them at least had like a master's in some kind of therapy or... Yeah, something like something that. Something like yeah. that, yeah. Um, but these psych- the psychics, I guess, we're presented with in this documentary are doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. At least they tell us they're doing it for the right yeah. reasons. Yeah, from what we see, there's no one that's like bringing in the same person over and over again and talking to their dead grandfather to find the lottery ticket that's lost or yeah. that kind of thing. This is more, hey, this person's lost this person some time ago, sometimes more recently, sometimes yeah. further along ago, but... They haven't been able to deal with that passing well enough to the point where, you know, they're not bothered by it every day. Yeah. And so they want a sense of closure, which, yeah. again, like we said, sometimes um, going the standard routes of like, you know, licensed therapist or psychologist or counseling, that sort of stuff, it doesn't. The answers that they will give you are, I would say, from my understanding of the universe, the most accurate answers, you know. But sometimes that, that doesn't help you move on. Yeah, look, in the studio, we're not superstitious. We're right. a little stitious. We're a little stitious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, know, it's so, our, our, you know, Nathan and myself, our mum is very into this stuff. She believes it completely without... Uh, no apart, reservation. Apart from one character we'll get into later, which she thinks is a bit silly. Um, but look, it, as in regards to whether I approve of the nature of this stuff, like I said, I'm on the fence. Uh, Because I don't know enough, you know, like I've seen videos that are very convincing and then I've also seen videos which are damning. Yeah. Um, But there's a, there was a, um, just to shoehorn in a little philosophy into this, you know, I apologize to listeners to have to suffer this. Uh, There was an occultist writer from the 20th century called Charles Ledbetter. And he, he was a psychic medium of sorts. He was, he investigated this kind of stuff, but he, his conclusion was if there are spirits on the earthly plane, if you go to a psychic, you're disturbing them. They have their own work to do to progress to wherever they need to be, whatever r- rules govern that next place. You're not actually talking to them, you're talking to a shadow of them, and you're disturbing their rest. So that's my feeling is, okay, you could be going to see, talk to a dead loved one, but this is where the predatory nature of it comes in, because on one hand, you don't know that you're talking to that real dead one, because even the psychics in this documentary themselves do not have complete faith in what they do. They multiple times they attest that 
I don't know if it's real. Sometimes I have doubts. Yeah. You know, it's not a they, firm They show the psychics messing up, more or less, multiple yeah. times. So that's number one, is you don't know who you're talking to is saying. You don't know that just because they say that's who they are, that's who they really are. But then number two, for, if it is real, you might be doing more damage by talking to these spirits just for your earthly closure. So it's like it, it might also come at a cost. You know what I mean? Which is something that I don't really talk about. Like, what does it mean to dis, to talk to a spirit? Is it a disruptive nature? And that's outside the purview of this episode, so I apologize. But it's just something I was thinking about on the way here. One thing I do like about this documentary, and I wish it did a little bit more, was they talk about, they talk to the psychics about how they experience their channeling, right? How, what they feel when they're channeling. And that's interesting to me because they, at least the ones that kind of, I guess, explained it, they, be- they feel something and they believe what they're doing. Whether they believe, and they say it in the one of the psychics says it in the in the film, they're not sure if everything they're saying is correct either. But that's the that's what they're receiving from the information. They're that's receiving. the information they're receiving yeah. from the universe, and it kind of it, it for me it brings especially there was one gentleman who was one of the psychics and he was he would draw and write as he was channeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I'm like. Is this dude just like a mad remote viewer? He can't turn yeah. off the tab. Well, it reminded me of the the encounter I had when I was eating KFC in my car, where that ge- <laughs> that gentleman came up to me and started telling me things about my aura, and then he wanted me to give him like twenty bucks, and he'd guess our mother's name, and then but he got out a pen and paper, as if he was going to do some type of work with the pen and paper to figure it out. And I'm like, maybe that is something that some psychics do because I don't I don't have a great knowledge about psychic practices. I, I'm still upset they even take him up. <laughs> he wanted me. He I, asked I would have fronted you the twenty dollars. Yeah, well, you went there. No, if you had he, called, be like, Alan, this is going down. He asked me to get twenty dollars out from an ATM. Yeah. I was like, Nah, come on, man. I'm he sorry. Wanted to, he wanted to steal your pin number and he can't run yeah. away. No, anyway, but, my point is, I, it could be very much a tool they use yeah. to decipher the knowledge. Well, no, like he he would write down symbols, and he would interpret them, and I'm like, that just sounds like remote viewing. Yeah, yeah. it does. Yeah. Um, I'm like, obviously, this is a, you know, which is more or less a proven science. Yeah. At this point. Um. And remote viewing, I'm a believer in remote viewing yeah. personally. I think it is true. How it's, how remote viewing works is subject to debate. Yeah, but that's something that can be proven statistically, yeah. if not scientifically. Um, you know, viewers can look into remote viewing if they want to go on the, I guess, the crazier side of the Tuesday review. We talk about it a little bit. Um, Alan's having a laugh here. No, it's yeah, I'm having a laugh. It's true. Uh, there's a there's a new and there's a new episode of the Sean Ryan show where he talks to one of the leading remote viewer, and he's this dude's a nuclear physicist, right? And he proved it scientifically. Right. That it's most likely precognition. Yeah, he's he doesn't um, believe in any of the woo out there stuff. He says it's something the brain does. We just don't have an answer for how the brain function works that way. Yeah, it's just something to do with time and like the brain. Like we encounter reality linearly, right? From yeah. past, you got me, you got me present. thinking about experiences now. Damn you! Yeah. Well, I, I, I apologize. We have to follow through on this thought before we move on. But the idea is essentially that you know the answers to whatever question they're going to ask you because you find out the answers in the future. There's some mechanism which the brain is able to draw future events back in time to help you out. Um, but it just uh, makes me wonder if I some of this derailing this episode. If some of this psychic phenomena, you know, like you know, I guess the impressions people are getting, if it's similar to remote viewing, yeah, a kind of um, emotional remote viewing. It's yeah, it's kind of just like you know they're receiving these images and feelings and senses and yeah. they're like interpreting them. It just sounds it's very similar. It could be in the same wheelhouse. Yeah, um, but anyway, it it is good and. I was yeah, I wasn't expecting I was expecting the emotional side of it. I wasn't expecting the emotional side of it from the point of view of the psychic though. No. Yeah. I was expecting all the waterworks and the tears from like the clientele because that comes with it. Yeah. Because that comes with the trade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um but uh yeah, it was good except for as Callum suggested earlier, the cat lady. Cool. Um it. look, so before we dive into spoilers, such as they are, um I wanna say I think the the one the the letdown for me with this film was that it's from a dominantly neutral perspective. So the, there's no, like, Alan, for example, was expecting uh, a yeah, documentary like where it was like a... Where, like, the underbelly of, you know, the millions of dollars the psychics correct. make every um, year. And this movie wasn't even pro-psychic anyway. It was a neutral look at a group of psychics who operate out of New York City. I think that all good documentaries have... They're all based on fact. But they have a kind of a narrative thread weaving through it. If we look at um, the last documentary we reviewed for MIF, uh, was the uh, Time Bomb Y2K documentary. That was about the lead up to the Y2K crisis, the 1999 
um, New Year's Eve event. And, like, that was told through, like, news reports, interviews of the time, and it started from the beginning chronologically making its way to New New Year's Eve at the ultimate event. And, like, most good documentaries um, will have a kind of a narrative thread weaving through it that, like, you know, we start in one place, we learn more about an event or something, and it all weaves together to culminate in an expose or a big interview or some final information piece that is revealed that ties everything together this film was kind of more loose in its design so what we have instead is just a group or a bunch of interviews with some psychics interspliced with some sessions that the psychics are conducting with their clients culminating in the psychic sitting in a room together uh talking to each other and channeling with each other which is fine but ultimately, like I said, I think that it, it lacks a kind of vitality for me because it, it was just a bunch of interviews. It was, I say this with respect because I, this is going to sound mean. It was kind of just like a very well-produced, very high-budget YouTube video. It didn't have that, doc, that feature film documentary feel to me. Uh, I feel you're, you're, that what you said there disparages certain YouTube videos. No, no, YouTube videos have come yeah. extremely... Yeah. YouTube documentaries have actually come extremely far. I, I feel there is a distinct narrative thread. It maybe didn't go in the direction you were thinking. I think it, there is a bit of... I would agree no, with Alan with a certain loose. subtext. Yeah. It's very loose. I, it's, I'm not saying loose. there's nothing there. I said it's just... It's just kind of like it just goes... It just kind of goes where it feels like going. The subtext slowly reveals itself through the lives... And I guess the backstory is that oh, they, of the psychics because yeah. the ultimate yeah, I know, truth. But my, you come my point to is, is like Lana Wilson, her it's related to the neutrality of the documentary. Are we in spoilers now? Kind of. You can't. I mean, really you, we can't really be. There's, there's no spoilers. Um, as such. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. We'll say yeah. spoiler alert for <laughs> light, <laughs> light, light spoiler warnings for look into my eyes. Should we go for a quick break before that or? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll go on a quick that. break before we go into spoilers. Sorry uh, to cut you off the kill. But we, we're going to disagree with you. We'll <laughs> tell you why after the break. We'll be right back after this quick break. You're back on the Tuesday Review. Um, yeah, so, sorry, boys. To better articulate my viewpoint, I feel like because the documentary is so neutral in its uh, expression, Lana Wilson's viewpoint is not a part of this film. So as such, there's no editorial thread in it at all. So what we have is just cameras in front of people... And then seeing what happens. And then, you know, there'll be... Editorial expression in documentary can happen a few ways. You know, you can have the narrator expressing their thoughts as the thing goes on. But then, you know, everything's editorial expression in a way. So, like, you know, a certain framing of a shot is editorial expression in a documentary. For all we know, you know, they rehearsed many different takes. You know, oh, can you try crying again because the light wasn't right? You know what I mean? Like... Just because something happens on camera doesn't mean it's authentic in the way that we think it's authentic, even though it's a documentary. Um, but my, my my point is that Lana Wilson, I feel, should have been a bigger part of this film because it's her opinion. Like, all, all in my opinion, all good films have to have some type of challenge or some type of uh, contrast in it. And in documentaries, that's best expressed through the documentarian and their subjects, whether it's like, take it's a bit different, but take Louis Thoreau, for example. If Louis Thoreau had done this type of documentary, it would have been him asking questions to the psychics and then they're being back and forth between them and exploring the content as we go on. The way this was done was very, I'm not in the room. This is an observer documentary. Well, yeah, and I think it's weak off for it. Because Louis Thoreau, if he had done this, he would have had the psychics on the back foot. Yeah, very, but it's not about no, back foot or no, front but foot. It it's is. Just, it is like like you said. It's such a neutral documentary for that reason. Is you push it one way or the other, you're gonna get people that are like, "Well, you're encouraging." People it's also scared. not a documentary about the psychic activity itself. Yeah. It's a documentary about people's pain. Yeah, it's about people dealing with loneliness and trauma, and I think that's why I think the thread that ultimately sticks with it is the reason these psychics are able to help the people they help is because they are also well, you know, I guess, versed in the same or similar traumas. And why a lot of them got into the psychic medium, I guess, subject matter in the first place, is to was to, at least at the time, deal with whatever they were going through. Yeah. Um, 
I've got a few notes, boys, so I'm sorry if All I right. Ra- take up, rattle them off. Take up, I'll take up James's position. Um, just interrupt me if I say anything out of line. <laughs> um, I feel like some of these. Uh, I'll try to hurry it up. Sorry, I'm looking at this. Are we get the full no, James's I'm, 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 I'm going to read up my notes real quick. <laughs> um, some of these, uh, some of these sessions seem predatory in nature. I can't articulate why. I just some of them I was watching and it made me feel dirty, as if it was like cold reading, and I didn't like it. Yeah, you know, there's that the that's famous, inescapable with psychics. Yeah, though. there's that famous. Oh, there's a man. Uh, that one, that scene where she's like, oh, "I'm getting a masculine presence," and then the lady's like, "No," and she's like, "No, there's definitely masculine." Pre-. And she's trying to force the lady to essentially say yes. Um, but, but again, you know, if that's the as we were discussing it, before, yeah. if that's the reading the lady is getting, or yeah. she's like doubling down, I'm like, no. If she has psychic activity, um, right? Let's say she is a psychic playing devil's avocado, and it is real, right? It's good that she's not backing down and yeah. saying, I'm not but, getting that anymore because you said no. It's yeah. like, no, that's what I'm getting. It that's is what it is. Yeah. Like, um, res- respect to the psychic yeah. for doing that. You yeah. know what I mean? They're not backing down because that's not the right answer. Mm. There was that's also what you want to have. A few a few of the people also, and again, this is this goes hand in hand with do- making documentaries and films in general. Some of them seem to really ham it up for the camera. You know, I didn't appreciate it. But to be fair, the... one of them also says she has a performance art performance art background. Yeah, and like then she kind there of. Are, there are several like oh, I'm not gonna call them fail actors because, you know, until their career is completely over, no uh, one's a fail yeah, actor. You know, we're... But fledgling actors. Yeah, yeah well, we're that's... we're we're a, we're a failing radio show. Fledgling, fledgling. <laughs> Um, if anything, we're actually up and coming because you know we're, we're moving up. So. Yeah, we're, we're doing okay. Um, so the, some of the failed readings were brutal to watch. I, I'm glad they were left in though. Um, that was uh, was uncomfortable viewing when they failed. It made me physically uncomfortable. Uh, the accurate readings though were very convincing. Um, yeah. That one with the family with the children who passed away. The, the, yeah, the little daughter and then the was two, dev- the was two. devastating. Uh, yeah. And it was interesting because it made me think of uh, as Nathan said, remote viewing. Because the psychic said, um, oh, you know, I started getting these impressions the day before. Yeah. And I was like, that's, we know, as we just watched a long form interview about remote viewing and sometimes they get the impressions early. Yeah. Uh, so I thought like, that was very interesting to hear that like the, the impressions don't come just because the people in the room, you might start getting impressions before the person's even entered the room. Yeah. Like the day before. So that's very fascinating. Um... The psychic stories are interesting, but the the stories of the psych the I mean the psychic readings are interesting, but the psychics themselves are also equally interesting. They're just a bunch of New York characters, you know, and that's and that's kind of interesting in and of themselves. Um, yeah, I like the fact that New York is present in this film. Yeah, you know, it's such a a lot of these people are just typical New Yorkers. They come off as typical interesting New Yorkers. Um, the length could be felt for me a bit, like it did feel a little long, but I think that's also because of there was a lack of the dominant coherent narrative thread. Like, I think that if you had it built, you know, like a traditional movie where it was like followed the narrative I through to the end, it would have felt a little like it was moving a bit quicker. I think because the documentary is mostly just sit down interviews. That's why it felt so long. If yeah. you're following a guy around New York for an hour and a half, then it might be a yeah. different. Yeah. There's a, yeah. It's a, it'll be a little more dynamic. Yeah. If they were walking while talking, then it might've been, had a different um, feel, but it was a fairly standard sit down. Lance, one question before I uh, stop talking, you boys can get a word in <laughs> Um, a question for the two of you guys and anyone who might end up watching this film. The reading where the two knew each other, they went to the same high school. Yes. Do you believe that was set up or was that coincidental? Because even though it's a documentary, does it mean they didn't do any funny business behind the scenes? Yeah. Look, the fact that he didn't remember her. Again. Yeah, well, he appeared to have not remembered her. <laughs> makes me want to think it's possibly more... Um, above board, but the other thing is, um, were was this like a free, you know, free psychic readings, free trip to New York? Yeah, well, I because I, that gentleman went to school there, and by school I think they meant like college slash whatever. High, I thought it was high school. I thought yeah. it was college. Oh, like, either but, way, but, you know. But they, anyway, Tomatoes I suspect that they yeah, yeah. had already been in that area, so maybe oh, they'll. Still that's what I was going to say. New York, you know, like New York's a large city. I think stranger things have happened. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, I think y- y- you're working in a sphere that is essentially customer service. Yeah. I'm not calling psychic readings customer service, but yeah, you get is, you get is. public clientele. Yeah, public clientele. Yeah, eventually you're going to get someone you know. You know, yeah. 
That's true, yeah. I'm surprised that hasn't happened already. Yeah. Should we talk about the... The yeah, more eccentric... We're, we're, we're going to talk about the pet in the room. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. All right. Who was... I, I forgot the young lady's name. Look, look. People's related... People's animal drama is real. <laughs> it is. Some of it is more real than others. It, it you is. You know, like, my dog doesn't like me when he's on the lead. <laughs> well, that's like, lady, <laughs> just be a strict parent. But, like, I feel bad for the guy with the... The um the the pet mon- the lizard the, the yeah. pe- uh, what was it was a bearded dragon yeah the bearded dragon like that dude he had some feels about that bearded yeah. dragon I res- like respect you know what yeah. I mean he he was like he was there for a real reason I think the lady who was just frustrated with her dog getting walked and he would yeah. like I'm like the lady with yeah the, that the one cat my cat keeps going to the door yeah <laughs> um, it's like have you met cats lady. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like some of those issues seemed very small yeah. to me. So, some of the and some of the information that that psychicals were providing is just like is just like general pet behavior that like any vet or animal um, adjacent like profession would know. Yeah. Uh, the the story with the the monta lizard and the story with the the girl who had the dog named Zeus. Yeah. Who ran not ran away but was lost. Those um. I'll I'll bring them back into, I think what I'll conclude with later on is that it's just, I don't think she was doing anything psychic. But I think... But she's counselling people through their pain. Yeah, she was counselling people through their pain and giving them the answer that is not necessarily true or correct, but the answer that will have them avoid the most grief in the future. Because that's part of this as well, is the unknown is sometimes the most hurtful thing, right? And... If people can, people can go to therapy and the therapist isn't going to tell them, oh, you know, your dog's okay. Your dog loves you. Your dog says he's cool. Yeah. He's, yeah. he's with you right Your dog's now. on the shaka because you, yeah. l- legally and, you know, ethically as a, you know, therapist, you can't say that either. Yeah. Because that's you know, and patently And like, untrue. they're not necessarily, you're not necessarily going to be helped with like, we'll say the uncertainty regarding a lost animal. Yeah. Um, it's just going to be, you know, you have to learn to live with it. But if you can get that relief through a psychic and they tell you that, oh, yeah, this is your dog, they're cool, they've moved on, but they're watching you, they'll be with you, that's what some people need. Yeah. You know, and especially if you're not being taken advantage of. In a predatory yeah. nature, at least these psychics that we saw didn't seem to be doing that. Yeah. It can't be a bad thing. Yeah. At and least in the, in those circumstances. Yeah. I think there's also an unspoken agreement that... I'm not saying this woman is... What she does is false. Because I don't know. But I, I think that if you're desperate enough to go and see a person who says that they can communicate with the spirit of an alive animal, I think there's an inherent understanding that you're going to pay this person to tell you what you basically want to hear. No questions asked because yeah. there's this understanding. Okay, we might believe in psychics, but you're, ta- you're trying to communicate with my alive dog's spirit to ask where he won't poop outside. Yeah. I think there's there's an understanding the, the, that you know we're gonna pre- we're gonna leave rational thought at the yeah. door. <laughs> it's a, again not to sound mean because for all I know it's completely real and I'm sounding like a dick, but it's like a different level than regular yeah. psychic mediums. It's a little more bizarre. Uh, but, I, I thought you were gonna go in a kinder direction than this, <laughs> which I will is if if you're you make me feel bad if you're in a position where you're seeking out a psychic individual to connect with an animal possibly the one that's passed away you're probably not doing that well emotionally no, in but life. we don't get to, we, we only see that a couple times in the film the rest of the time it's like oh how come my dog doesn't like the lead yeah yeah but we i guess it was about 50 <laughs> 50 yeah. but yeah you're not doing that well i think and again how much a therapist can help you in this situation there are certain things they could definitely deal with and you should, probably should be dealing with through them some aspects i think you a lot of these people probably have tried therapy and other things sometimes this is the answer that they yeah. need um bringing it back to more individuals who've lost family members the other psychics and discussing with them again my universe understanding or not my choice of understanding of the universe is far more empirical that you know there aren't souls and all that jazz but then again i see some weird things here and there Look, so, look, I'm always I, open for answers. I will say, to... like I said, when when they get the accurate readings, they're convincing, yeah. right? Like when you say, "Oh, there's two children here," and the family, like the the mother's face was like, 
Like, you know, like, like it registered immediately and she's like, oh yeah, the older one. Yeah. And then they're like, oh my God. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think. And like, the, she's like, oh yeah, I feel them too. And she's like, I know you do. Cause they were like, it's the, and then the daughter's like, oh yeah, they scare me. Yeah. I'm like, unless it was rehearsed beforehand, which like I said, even though it's a documentary, it's possible that it was yeah, rehearsed. Yeah, the dad was like, hey, this is, this is our situation. My wife's having trouble dealing with it. Okay. Like, yeah, we don't, uh, we don't actually we don't, know. Yeah. But my point is like, that's why I'm on the fence is because sometimes you'll hear or see something and it just, like, it'll chill you. Yeah. I think, look, we're sitting here in the studio being, we'll say it largely agnostic, right? Yeah. Just of general supernatural phenomena, yeah. with exceptions. Uh, yeah. We're a little stitious. Yeah. And I think if you're the type of person that is more superstitious or is more religious or is, um, you know, in that way inclined into mysticism, yeah. then, you know, I think these people who have these troubles probably got a, got a lot out of it. Oh, yeah, 100%. And if it's, you know, if it helps them, then it's not, yeah. you know, with the right, I guess, with the right psychic who's doing it for the right reasons, I not thought preying was, upon people, yeah. then it's not necessarily a bad yeah. thing. What I thought was interesting about this film is how vulnerable it portrayed the psychics. Because it says, like, you know, we can see other people's issues, but we can't always see our own. We're and, still human in that way. And we, I think that's well, that was part of the point of the documentary, is that all the psychics were people in pain. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, they'd, some one of them had recently lost his best friend. Um, you know, some of them had issues, like, with family. And uh, some of them had trouble leaving the house, right? A couple yeah. of them were basically hermits, recluses, trying, just trying to brave the outside world and yeah. be a part of the world. And that's yeah. a struggle in and of itself, you know. Some people with just terrible home lives. Yeah. Um, and you know, props to Eugene. You know, it was, was it Eugene, the big fella? I think it was Eugene. And you know, like we go through his journey about him trying to do sing in public. Yeah, you that know, was br- that, that was my that was to me that was the most dominant narrative thread was him trying to re trying to integrate into society. Yeah, because he he seemed a bit like a hoarder to me. Yeah. Um, and you know, he had trouble facing the outside world and that's a common thread through all of these psychics. Yeah. Um, they had trouble facing the, the real world and, um, you know, and you see his journey yeah. from like making the decision to go to the open mic night to, I guess, you know, getting some vocal training yeah. and then performing. And he was a pretty decent singer. Yeah. Uh, like he yeah. had a beautiful voice. Yeah. Like, yeah. um, it, I was impressed when he was doing the rehearsal. I was like, damn, you know? Eugene's got the chops here. Yeah. Um, it, it, that was, yeah. Like, it was helping them also, whether it's influenced by the actual documentary maker, Lana, or whether it's just, you know, part of the, the actual documentary. Around, yeah. But it was a positive influence that kind of came from it. The yeah. beginning where they start with the female doctor, who's, we'll call it, she's not old, but she is older. Uh, fifty. She's yeah. fifty. Or yeah. She's so she's she's she's, she's she's been yeah. about twenty years in the industry at the time. She discusses a patient uh, from her very early days, um, a young girl who basically ends up dying, or more or less in her arms, uh, and asking questions about you know whether that patient is, or whether that person's spirit is still there, whether they're okay, and from my own personal medical background, it's again you're in such an empirical environment. There's no such thing as ghosts. There's no such thing as spirits, you know. Person dies. It's very upsetting. But they're gone. And that's something that the doctor talks about in the film is that, you know, there's no one teaches you as a doctor how to deal with the grief that you that you encounter every day, yeah. especially we'll say as an ER doctor or yeah. when you when you're dealing trauma with these surgeon ho- and such. a trauma surgeon when you're dealing with horrible things every day. How do you compartmentalize that? Yeah. How do you process that? Because what ends up happening for a lot of them is they'll become very, very calloused and hardened to it. And they're just like, well, that doctor's a bit of a dick. But there's a reason for it because the ones that were very, very empathetic are no longer either doctors or have, in many cases, taken their lives. Like, I think under 60, the one of the biggest uh, death causes for doctors is, you know... And vets. Um, yeah, and vets. Is, uh, yeah, and dentists. Yeah. So, I guess that is, you know... That's something that the documentary doesn't obviously deal with, um, but it is, I guess, an important discussion they have. And if that is something that affects you, you can please call Lifeline on thirteen eleven fourteen, um, or search up helplines wherever you are locally. Um, but uh, it starts off with her, it goes into the other documentary, and it kind of towards the end, you kind of complete that story, and one of the uh, psychics, I guess, discusses with her that it's okay, you can let it out. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. That's what I guess that lady doctor was after the whole time. 
Mm. It wasn't really, you know, un- uh, understanding the paranormal or understanding of the girl's spirit. It was more about finally getting permission, I guess, in a way. Yeah, that's grief. right. Like universal permission. Yeah. You know what I mean? In quote- I think that's what a lot of it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's, I want a sign from the universe to let this go. Yeah. Because a therapist can't give you that. No. They can't. Re- they can tell you. They can be like, look, it's irrational for you to feel this way. You have to integrate it or somehow process it. Yeah. But that's not the same as universal permission. That's yeah. not saying your grandfather forgives you or he says this or that or... You know what I mean? There, mm. there was a... One of the psychics did a reading about a gentleman uh, with a, like a great, great, great something grandfather was a, was a who was a slave. And then he she They had this exact discussion where it's like, you can't be shackled by that. Yeah. That no. was most interesting because that was almost like a psychic back and forth because yeah. he was also allegedly receiving images. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. that's kind of interesting. The psychic kind of bouncing off each other aspect yeah. to that was cool. He's like, what are you seeing? And he turns around and says, I'm seeing my grandfather's back. Yeah. So, you know, you know, I think you hit the nail on the head. Times where it's not so much the authenticity of the reading. It's the the unwritten agreement that it's like, this is some kind of supernatural uh, letting go that I can cling to that yeah. lets me say, okay, I don't have to feel so bad now because yeah. the universe is allowing this. And people, you know, a lot of people need that, right? There are a lot of people that are religious and, it's, and uh, that's their crux in life, you yeah. know? Yeah. Like if you believe there's the higher power and you go into a a bodily heaven, yeah. you know, and like you're with your loved ones and your friends and family and your pets in heaven after you die, people, a lot of people rely on that yeah. to get through their day. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, and so this true. is a similar analog that will call it you know, less inclined religious people can do like alternate, use, yeah. alternate religion, an alternate spirit. it's spirituality. An alternate yeah, spirituality. Because like yeah. these people would go to church and then they would say it's okay, they're with Jesus, and yeah. then they, you'd have you'd have a prayer, and then you'd kind of be like, okay, well, you know, I've now talked to God. That communion, like the communion, like you have with the spirits, and then you relay that information in a traditional setting. That's between you and God directly. Yeah. But if you're not a, you know, for a lot of people, younger people these days don't connect with the Catholic Church like they did. Many years ago, for a myriad of reasons, which you know, which is out of our out of purview for our discussion here, some of these people need a place to turn to for spiritual reasons, and the big religions, for better or worse, for a lot of these young people, they're just not offering what they used to. Yeah. So, like you know, these psychics can give you cut the, cut the middleman out, and you know, you don't have to talk to God when you can talk to whoever or whatever directly. I'm not saying that's a good thing. It is what it is. Like, the the film's neutral for a reason. It's not our place to judge. Yeah, it's, it's not our place to judge, but it's certainly a look on how people are able to deal with their grief. Yeah. Um, and, and that's the most important thing. Like you said, therapy, counselling, all kind of medical solutions have their place, but for a myriad of reasons, it doesn't work for everybody. And yeah. giving something like this a go could be, in some people's case, a solution. It wouldn't maybe be the solution, but it can be something that helps them move Ultimately, their life along. I would asterisk this episode with we're not telling people to go out and Google yeah, medium. Like oh, no, readers. no, 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 no. Because yeah. 90% of the time, you're going to go to someone who's just basically going to scam you. Yeah, who's going to ask you for more money constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Can you send me your Facebook log? Your Facebook invasion <laughs> yeah, yeah. first? Yeah. They're going to they're gonna say, I see someone with a Name blue shirt. With a. So you work for Big W. Yeah. Like Name begin with A, B, C, D. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you get the South Park episode. Yeah. But like you said, sometimes you've lost a family member, whether it's maybe after a fight or something. And yeah. a therapist will never be able to, you know, again, ethically... Give you that closure. Yeah, ethically tell you that, yeah, man, he's like, thumbs up, man. It's all good. It's all water <laughs> yeah. on the bridge. That's it. Yeah. But a, you know, a psychic potentially could. You never hear. I'm sorry. This is this. Is, I shouldn't laugh, but you never hear a psychic say, "Yeah, he's so mad about that." Like, don't <laughs> just stop. He's so salty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're like, like uh, he, you messed up. He's waiting. He yeah, needs a waiting. few weeks. Yeah, he Come needs... back in a few weeks, yeah, and you he might to, be happy. You need and... to be doing some penance outside, son. You know, none of that. But again, it's it's about helping people find a bit of closure, about helping people lonely find lonely people find a bit of connection. Um, yeah. while themselves, you know, finding that connection or reestablishing that connection. Um, I think overall, I really did enjoy the, the documentary. It was a bit of an emotional roller coaster because I was expecting one thing. Yeah. <laughs> I got into something <laughs> considerably yeah. different. Um, and it did, again, it did change my mind a little bit on kind of 
my all my preconceived notions on it, psychics. It does soften you a little bit on the idea of psychics. Like I've, you know, most of my kind of connotations towards this have been negative. Yeah. And yeah. watching this documentary, it shows you know people use it it's to get also, over their own yeah. issues and sort through their kinds of thoughts and. It's also feelings. people from all walks of life doing it. You know, yeah. people who don't, people from all kinds of different backgrounds. Yeah. Like the the doctor lady, you thought was the last person that would be going to a psychic. Yeah. Yeah, you know, as like a hard science, yeah. But kind you know, of I, like professional. my my view of the gypsy is always the South Park stereotype gy- <laughs> yeah. gypsy character. Yeah. When it's like, no, it's it's people who are just like you and me. Yeah. They just claim to have special abilities yeah. that they often can't control. It's on or off, you know, much like yeah. remote viewing. And, and they're not, you know, one hundred percent accurate. And for the most part, they don't claim they're to be one hundred percent. See, that was what was so fascinating to me is that they're like, we don't know if it's a like when it works, you're like, wow, my god, and then when it doesn't work, you're like, I'm an idiot. I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. Yeah, and I thought I thought that 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 expression of vulnerability was fascinating to me because yeah. most of these people online, like psychics online, they're like, oh no, I'm a hundred percent real. Yeah, I can like, talk I, to the dead. I totally did not Google you and find out every bit of information um, about you before you called. And then you <laughs> know the the ones we get are kind of vulnerable. Yeah, yeah, which is. Again, a, a different perspective look because we're so used to exposés and documentaries of that nature. Um, I I did appreciate it. I think it's worth a watch. Definitely is. Um, this is extremely pre-release for now, I believe. I'm not sure where people can watch it yet, but uh, we'll, we'll keep people updated. It's definitely probably going to be at the Melbourne International Film Festival somewhere. Yeah, so if you're frequenting that, uh, have a look around. That's probably one of the ones to put on your list. I would like this in a, in a book form. You know what I mean? I feel like there's more untapped stuff. And the problem with all, all films, right? You've only got a certain amount of runtime. Yeah. You're going to have to cut some scenes. I want to know what readings didn't make the cut. What what didn't... I, I just want to know what was left out, for, yeah. for better or worse. I want to know more. So, currently, this movie has two screenings for the Melbourne International Film Festival. For your listeners that are interested, you can watch it at the twenty on the 21st of August at 9pm at the Capitol Theatre. Or at the... Australian Centre for the Moving Image uh, in Theatre Number 1. Acme. Acme, yes. Yeah, on the 24th of August. Yeah. So you can see this movie there. Um, it is worth a watch. It is very heavy going. So, you know, obviously yeah, if you have good. maybe some issues with grief or, you know, you're sensitive to some of these topics, maybe approach it with caution because it, it, it does kind of go heavily into some of those topics as it well. It could also be a cathartic watch if you're brave enough. Yeah. Definitely. I reckon that's all the time we've got for today. Yeah, good discussion. Yeah. I liked your points, Callum. We did challenge some of them, but, you know. I tried. I, I wrote notes. I tried. Um, all right. Um, keep an eye on the socials. It's going to be a big few weeks as we head into the Melbourne International Film Festival. Um, so there'll be lots of stuff going on. Uh, maybe we'll even throw up some photos from our movie premiere on Saturday. Yeah, mm. surely not in the photo. No, you in the uh, Everyone's going to be in the photo, mate. You can't get away from it. You're going to be in the, um, the actual interview, though. You know what? You've got to be careful. Otherwise, we'll Photoshop your head bigger than it is. <laughs> we'll just like, every time he comes in a photo, his head's like just 1.3 times the size. Not big enough so everyone's like, that's obviously a Photoshop, but they'll just think, man, he's got a big head. <laughs> or make his ears a bit bigger. It'll be funny. Anyway. Uh... <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening, everyone. You can uh, find us on all the socials. Uh, Tuesday Review is on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, Blue Sky News Masked, Twitter and YouTube, at Tuesday Review AU on all platforms. We also have Letterboxd. I am Nathan B underscore 90. Uh, James is Channel Drifter. If he's watching movies in Europe, we don't know. Uh, Alums is Alum 20. Mm-hmm. And Callum's is Callum Tuesday. Correct. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening. Adios, cousins.